Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I'm here to talk about what I see as some of the main crypto regulatory trends in the US and Asia. Uh, quickly, by way of background, I live in the United States. I spend most of my time in the United States, but I also spend a lot of time here in Asia, particularly in China and Japan. And over the past few years, I've spent a lot of time comparing the regulatory structures in these two regions. Okay, so what does this mean? Crypto friendly is not crypto easy. This is what I think is a relevant framework for understanding the different regulatory approaches in the United States and Asia. So in Asia, for example, we often hear about crypto friendly places. For example, Hong Kong, everyone's talking about how Hong Kong is crypto friendly or Singapore, crypto friendly, Japan, crypto friendly. But I think this term can actually be a little bit misleading because when you hear crypto friendly, you might think, okay, I can go and do whatever I want. That's actually totally not true. Crypto friendly does not mean crypto easy. And what I mean by that is that some of the so-called crypto friendly countries have some of the toughest rules and requirements in the world. Um, so I'm gonna get to some of these countries uh, the ones I want to highlight today are Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and Korea, and the United States, which is very different from all of these. Okay, let's just start with the United States for a moment. Um, we're talking about crypto regulatory trends. This is probably the most important thing to have happened in the United States this year. The U.S. has finally approved... 11 spot Bitcoin ETF applications. As many of you know, the crypto industry was waiting for this for many, many years. Many ETF applications were rejected. Um, and after its approval, we have seen a surge in the price of Bitcoin. We saw a surge in the price of Bitcoin leading up to the approvals. Um, this definitely was a show of some kind of regulatory I don't know, I guess regulatory agreement from the United States that crypto is here to stay, but it came with some resistance. The SEC was very resistant to approving these, these ETFs because they thought that the market, the Bitcoin market, was subject to fraud and manipulation. Um, so now we are talking about Ether ETF, spot Ether ETF ap approvals. That seems very uncertain. We don't know if that's going to happen. Some applications are in. We probably won't know at least until May if there's any chance for these at all. Um, I do want to highlight, though, another trend that I think is kind of important, which is that for people who are sort of pure crypto advocates, there's a little bit of a contradiction with the idea of Bitcoin ETFs. Because if you look at the original Bitcoin white paper, which I just put a sentence from there on the screen, the whole idea of Bitcoin is that it's supposed to be independent of financial institutions and independent of third parties. It's basically everything that an ETF is not. So I think this is a little bit of a mixed trend. On the one hand, it shows that, yes, there is regulatory, institutional, Wall Street approval for Bitcoin. On the other hand, ETFs are intermediated by a third party. It is not holding your Bitcoin. So I think there's a little bit of a two different trends happening here. Okay, so back to the United States. Um, like I said, the ETF was a positive development, but this is just some of the SEC enforcement cases from the past couple of years. This is not all of them. This is just some of the more well-known ones that I chose for this slide. Um, and this is why the SEC is widely criticized in the crypto industry for something that's called regulation by enforcement. Now, I'm not going to comment on all these cases if they're right or wrong. The point is that what many people in the crypto industry say is that the U.S. does not have clear regulation from the beginning. You only really know their position on crypto with these enforcement actions. But I want to highlight another really important data point from this slide, which is that if you look at this slide, quite a few of these entities are not in the United States. And that means that 
even if you're outside of the United States, you are in the reach of US law. This is very important. Now, we saw this with Binance that just got in trouble with the US Department of Justice. We saw this with FTX. It does not matter if you're registered in the United States at, at all. And so this whole idea of like borderless crypto companies is kind of a myth. Crypto can be borderless, but, but crypto companies, they have to play by the rules of different countries. And US prosecutors have shown that they are very creative and very aggressive in going after anybody that they think is, via, is, is harming US investors, even if they're outside of the United States. So that's just an important takeaway from this. All right, I'm just going to move on to Asia, um, going, going very quickly throughout the world. Um, talk, I'm going to talk in depth about Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and Korea, but I just quickly want to say, and I know there's probably many people here from mainland China, that mainland China is still really, really important. I'm sure many of you already know that. You don't need me to tell you that, but it's very important. It is not out of the game. China is important in Web3. The fact that Hong Kong is showing friendliness to digital assets, that is related to the Chinese market. Um, and I think we are going to start seeing more and more mainland Chinese talent coming here to Hong Kong. Okay, Hong Kong. Again, I'm sure many of you know some of this, so I'm just gonna go over it briefly. One of Hong Kong's greatest strengths, which has been talked a lot at, about at this event, is that it has comprehensive virtual asset regulation. That means that the rules, they're clear, you know what they are, you know what you can do, you know what you can't do. However, those rules are very, very strict. Now, Hong Kong used to have licensing for exchanges for professional investors, they've moved it to retail investors, but still, very few exchanges actually have a license. Hashkey, as we know, is one of them, but it is really hard to get an exchange license in Hong Kong. And the compliance costs are high, the legal costs are high, insurance costs are high. So this is, again, goes back to my earlier point, which is crypto friendly, not crypto easy. Hong Kong might be friendly to crypto, but if you come here and you try to open an exchange, it is not going to be easy at all. Um, Hong Kong has a bunch of other really strict requirements, such as 98% cold storage. That's one of the highest in the world. Um, strict rules on custody. You basically have to establish, exchanges have to establish a legal entity inside of Hong Kong. Um, and you know, Hong Kong is also doing exciting things like a new sandbox for stablecoin issuers. And also now there's excitement about this idea of um, spot Bitcoin ETFs in Hong Kong. And some of those applications are already here. Okay, Singapore. So let's talk about Singapore for a second. It's really interesting because people are always like, oh, Singapore is crypto friendly. Singapore is not really crypto friendly. Let's just be clear about that. Singapore is friendly towards tokenization. It's friendly towards digital asset innovation, but it's not accurate to say Singapore is crypto friendly. That's an inaccurate term. Look at some of the statements from MAS. Um, yes to digital asset innovation, no to cryptocurrency speculation. That's from MAS. In the last year at the Singapore FinTech Festival, Ravi Menon of MAS said, cryptocurrencies have failed the test of digital money. That is not crypto friendly. That is not a friendly attitude towards crypto. But why do we think of Singapore as crypto friendly? Because Singapore has for a long time had very clear regulation. They have a consultative approach with the industry. And again, they're very friendly to digital asset innovation and tokenization. They're doing some interesting things like Project Guardian. That's like a, they're working with a lot of different um, traditional finance institutions, different blockchains and working on global digital asset tokenization. But I think it's important to just understand what Singapore is and what Singapore is not. For example, very strict rules there. Crypto service providers are restricted from advertising in public places. Like Singapore wants to cut down on retail speculation. So I just think it's important to understand that difference. Okay, Japan is another really interesting case. Japan, I think, is a little more neutral. Like, Japan hasn't made negative statements about crypto per se. Um, Japan was one of, like, the first important players in cryptocurrency because, as many of you know, Mt. Gox was in Japan. That's, like, one of the first exchanges. Japan also had a lot of really bad things happen really early. So, like, Mt. Gox was hacked, and then a few years later, CoinCheck, uh, was hacked in early 2018. At the time, that was the largest crypto hack in, in crypto history. It was a really big deal. Japanese regulators got really worried about it. 
and they put some very strict regulations in place. For example, segregation of assets. This is for exchanges. It basically means that corporate assets and customer assets have to be separated. Um, now, a bunch of different jurisdictions have that, but Japan was early in having that. This was super important when FTX collapsed, because when FTX collapsed, Japanese FTX users were able to get their money back because of this, because of the separation of assets. So this was like a really big victory for Japanese regulation. Japanese, Japan also has very high um, percentage of cold storage requirement, which they learned from the hacks. Um, so, you know, another thing about Japan that many people don't know is that it's one of the first major economies in the world to have comprehensive stablecoin regulation. They are way in ahead of the United States. The United States has no stablecoin regulation. There have been all these bills going through Congress. Nothing's gotten passed. I really don't think anything big is going to happen before the election. Japan has it. It has it. So that's a really big deal. But again, it's really hard to issue a stablecoin in Japan. It's limited. You have to be a, a bank or a trust company or like a fund transfer service. And then there's a lot of rules about like what you can do with those assets for trusts. A hundred percent of the assets backing the stablecoins have to be inside Japan. That's really, really strict. And also for yen based stablecoins, you have to be very strict about where you invest those assets. So it's basically limited to bank deposits, which have very low interest. So it's like, how do you make money? So it's challenging to do a stablecoin in Japan, but they get a lot of credit for having at least trying a, a regulation framework. They're also doing really cool things like um, working to clarify the legal status of DAOs. But, you know, given that Japan is doing all this cool stuff, I spend a lot of time in Tokyo. Um, I get this question a lot. It's like, well, why are there not more startups going to Japan? Why are they all going to Singapore or Dubai and Hong Kong? I think probably one simple reason is just taxes. Japan has is really going to have a hard time competing with like Singapore with taxes because um, j j crypto gains can be taxed as income that can be as high as 50%. That's just like a really big barrier. So Japan recently revised another tax regulation, but it's still pretty high. And I think that's a pretty big obstacle. C again, competing with Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, Okay, Korea. Korea is interesting. Korea is really complicated. Um, Korea is a majorly important retail market. It's pretty much only retail. Um, but here's the thing about Korea. Korean investors, Korean traders can drive the global price of altcoins. So like if you're a project and you can get listed on a Korean exchange, it's actually pretty important. And um, if you want more information about this, Dspread did a really good report about altcoins in Korea. But just suffice to say, there's a lot of altcoin demand in Korea. And there's been times, for example, where like I've been in the United States and I've seen a certain coin just surge and I don't know why because there's no news like maybe I, one time it happened with XRP and then you look and you see it's all the Korean market so like Korean traders can move the price of a coin worldwide they're very very powerful um, they have an interesting layout up it is the dominant exchange by far it's kind of one exchange dominating you know the, the market um, Korea I think would have been a much more open to crypto, it would be more open to crypto if Terra Luna had not crashed. As you all know, this was the algorithmic stablecoin project. Um, Do Kwon is Korean national. There were a lot of really big losses in Korea, and that had a really big effect on the crypto, crypto regulation. I think it really set things back a lot, and it had a very big chilling effect. But I think now Korea is starting to move on from that. And we're starting, like, for example, this year, there will be new regulations taking hold um, this summer. They're mostly focused on investor protection, but it's still kind of showing that they are acknowledging the crypto industry. Some Korean um, crypto industry players will complain that Korea is too focused on investor protection and not focused enough on like promotion of the industry. But again, that could change. Um, the other criticism I sometimes hear about Korea is that um, there's still these areas of shadow regulation. Shadow regulation basically means that like people know you can't do something, but it's not in the law. It's still a little bit gray. So I guess Korea in that sense is a little closer to the United States in having these gray areas. 
Um, okay, I'm almost out of time. I just went through a lot of countries in a very short period of time. I have to say that I, you know, there's a lot of other things happening in Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam. I just don't have time to discuss every country in Asia, but this is just some of the, the jurisdictions I chose to highlight. Um, if you have any questions, come find me. I'm always happy to talk about this in more detail. Thank you.